Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to the Berkshire Battalion Signal Corps podcast covering the weekend that was and the weekend to come. Al Kessler here with you. We've got a special treat for you folks today. Not only are we joined by the ever-ready-to-talk Ross Jacobs. Good also. afternoon. Well, it's good to talk to you again, Ross. But we've got a special guest in here today, and why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, it's Bill Bird, the official scorer and sometime referee. <laughs> Yeah, Bill has been uh, to every single battalion home game, like actually uh, I have, and Al has missed a, what, just I think a couple after yeah. being uh, attacked by a killer flu virus. Yeah, but yeah, attacked, between attacked the three of the right us, we between the three of us, uh, we have seen practically every game here, and uh, I think uh, Bill, it's uh, great to have you here. Yeah, it's good to be, good to be on. Yeah, good it's 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 a shame that we haven't done this uh, before. I think we might have to keep this uh, tradition for the rest of the season. Certainly getting the insight from all three of us is going to help. As you said, we've all seen our fair share of the games. Of course, I did have that battle with the flu, um, and I, I still, I'm still kicking myself for missing those week, that weekend because those were some fun games that I heard yeah. about. We forgive you. Good. Well, unfortunately, Contrado hasn't forgiven me because he still wants the footage from it, and Messinas hasn't forgiven me because he wants the footage from those games too. Of course, I wasn't there to do anything about it, but... All right, let's 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 crack straight into the weekend that just happened. A four-game road trip Friday to Monday that saw the Berkshire Battalion going out west. It was a 7-3 to three loss to Dayton in Dayton on Friday the 13th. And that's kind of a tough one to drop. That was that was a tough one to lose right off the bat in the uh, for the start of that road trip. It was, and it really kind of goes, it went against a couple of the things that we had seen from the battalion going forward uh, where they had only scored three goals against Dayton and then again three goals the next night against Danville. And these guys have been usually putting forth a much stronger offensive effort than just three goals a game. Um, and and uh, then, uh, you know, the, the, the Danville game after that was very close, but I think Dayton got away from them early. It just goes, goes to show you, I think, what kind of a team Dayton's looking, gonna be, looking to be uh, for the playoffs. Yeah, yeah, it looks yeah. like Dayton's got a strong team coming down the stretch. And Dayton is probably, I think, man for man defensively, is probably has some of the best defensive core in the league, especially with uh, with Brian March back there. Uh, he's he's a pretty solid two-way defenseman. Yeah, absolutely. Their defense is very, very strong. Uh, Mike Kozlowskis had two goals in that game. We're going to be talking about him a lot from this weekend. But uh, just an interesting note, former battalion player Lester Brown actually scoring a goal against his former team in that game. It was actually... Uh, Dayton's sixth of the game uh, in the late in the second period, but uh, three goals right off the bat uh, for Dayton. I mean, the first one happened 59 seconds into the game. Ahmed Mafuz shorthanded, and that guy's just an incredible talent. It's going to be really tough to deal with him moving forward. Yeah, um, you could tell that you know in in the past the uh, the battalion has had trouble with Dayton. They've definitely had trouble with with Marks and Van Weisberg, and it's been. You know, they're, they're a very strong team. What can you say? Um, strong goaltending, strong defense, and they can put the puck in the net. As you can see, you know, seven goals, that's nothing to sneeze at. Now, whether or not that's because of whatever is going on between, uh, you know, the, the long trip out to Dayton and the fact that Louis George was not in net or even available for the entire weekend. But uh, Steve Messina had a good shot at that game. Uh, I don't think it went particularly well for him as he was replaced um, part of the way through for uh, new battalion member Robert Bowden. And I don't know if we know a whole lot about Robert. Albert, do you guys know anything about this guy? Uh, uh, I, think he was, I think he put an assumption. He did. Oh, assumption. Uh, out in Worcester. Yeah. There was he, Worcester? Yeah. 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 So a Massachusetts boy. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and certainly a very serviceable backup, I think. Obviously, it's a, it's a huge loss uh, not having Louis George in the lineup. That's going to be really tough to contend with. Um, but, he did get both of the wins on um, on Sunday and Monday, though. He did. And uh, also an interesting note, as uh, just to add sort of insult to injury for this really tough road trip, and you really got to hand it to these battalion guys and fans, next time you see the battalion, which will, of course, be this upcoming weekend, definitely offer your warmest regards to them. They went this entire road trip without heat on the bus. <laughs> I had heard they actually had heat for the second uh, second half of the bus. It's going out to Dayton. Uh, they didn't have it, but no, it, they, it came back on the way back. It, in from it came back briefly, but then went away. They didn't actually get the heat back until they left Steel City 
um, on Tuesday morning. Yeah, it was still it was a tough trip, no doubt about that. But uh, before we look into the other games from the weekend, just to note, the Berkshire Battalion in four games with six power play goals. I mean, we're talking about uh, percentage-wise the league worst man advantage unit. Six power play goals in four games. That's not too shabby, and I think that's a key that we can definitely look at for this team's turnaround as they're rushing headlong into the playoffs. I mean. For for a guy for a team, excuse me, that really just had a lot of problems early on in the season with that man advantage. Things are really starting to turn around. They are, and um, as interesting as the special teams play has been, they have been able to get some power play goals. There was a shorty too mm-hmm. down, I think, in Steel City, and um, I, I still think though, if it's a couple of things they have to take care of, you know, uh, defensively. And and in the net, if they don't have Louis, I mean, you really got to be, you know, you really got to be careful when you know these guys are tired, and um, and especially in the, in the back line. I think the forwards have been doing an excellent job the whole season long, but I think the problem has always been, like you said, special teams, and it, it's it, it could be it could be a wonderful thing. But what what do you think, for instance, is there? A specific thing that you could point to, Al or Bill, for uh, uh, the improvement in the special teams. Well, the, the, the thing for me with the power play, it seems like it really got a kickstart after that second period gong show with Watertown. Uh, Watertown took a lot of penalties, came out in the third period, and we were able to get some. Puck co- I think we got a couple power play goals there in that game yeah. to mm-hmm. really kind of salt that game away. And I think that's kind of been a catalyst uh, going forward through that, and then the uh, the uh, sweep of Dan Barry. Uh, and then it's, it's kind of continued right from there. So I think it kind of got a shot in the arm with that Watertown series. But I think the power play is going to become more crucial coming down the stretch because we do have a lot of games with Watertown, a team that takes a lot of penalties. Yeah, and they, absolutely. They, they need to make them pay when they're in the box. And you could tell because these PK units, that we had, I mean, the power play units have been going on for a little while now, but they usually will have, uh, I, I think we talked about this a couple of podcasts ago, Al, uh, Morton and Tracy on the back line, five forwards playing uh, on the power play. Yeah, that's or a, four and Jeff Sanders. Yeah, that's the uh, the second power play unit, which I believe is Dolman, Prendergast, and Keslowskis down low with Morton and Tracy on the blue line, and that's the second unit. The f- and exactly. they've been doing a lot, the lion's share of the uh, goal scoring on the power play. The f- the first man advantage unit is. Uh, Antipin, Gavrik, uh, and Unak down low with Sanders and Guskov on the points. And it seems like really, we, we talked about this uh, before we started the show, but defensive scoring has been a problem for the Berkshire Battalion. But when you got Jeff Sanders set up in the high slot on a sharp angle, he's been burying those goals on the Sanders man advantage. Is the, 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 Sanders is the defensive leader in scoring. Uh, well, before, uh, now he is anyway, uh, with Lisko gone. Yeah. But, uh, most of been... most of Lisko's scoring, of course, as, as Bill pointed this out earlier, most Lisko's scoring came when he was playing forward. Yes, and uh, you know, but you take a look at you know Ritter, who got a couple of assists this weekend. Um, Dads, who has not made this, who has not really cracked the uh, score sheet at all. Um, McCurtain, who we've talked about last podcast, and he has an offensive mind to him. Not you know, not so much on the power play anyway. He doesn't usually play on the power play. But uh, and and then uh, Judd Warren, who is uh, you know a very solid defenseman, but neither of these guys, none of these guys, are really making a, you know a big you know they, you don't they do you don't see a lot of big blasts from the blue line from these guys. Yeah. I don't think anyway the way you see it from you know other leagues or other teams. Yeah, that's that's absolutely very true. Dayton right. does that a lot, right? All, I mean, doesn't Mark do that? He sits up on the blue line and like yeah, Mark, Mark just fires away from back there. Dan yeah, exactly. Danbury's a big fan of that uh, that power play, especially when on the power play, they're a big fan of doing that. All right, let's move forward though to Saturday, the fourteenth, Valentine's Day. It was anything but a sweet night for the Berkshire Battalion, giving up two goals with just minutes left to go in the third period. Uh, one on the power play to Levac, and then another one to Browson. Uh, the Levac goal was 17:58. The Browson goal 19:24 to tie that game, and then it was AJ Tessariero, four minutes and 20 into the overtime period to seal that game for Danville. That's that was a big loss, but you got to tip your cap to Steve Messina. He faced 54 shots in that game. Yeah, he did. And I again with the late penalties, uh, Prendergast for elbowing with. Uh, Three minutes left, um, and that was you know that was just 
It's a killer. And, and how many times have we seen that this year? Like three times now, four times? Mm-hmm. You know, less than five minutes left? Uh, a couple Tons of weekends ago. Lead. Yeah. A couple of weekends ago against Watertown. Oh, yeah, exactly. And then, from, and then the shootout loss against Danville. We've talked a lot uh, over the season about the third period issues, you know, coming into the third period with a lead, uh, especially through that whole, whole stretch in December and January. Um, coming into a third period with a lead and then coughing it up late, and you saw it happen in slow motion against the, in, in Danville, and it just, oh, it just made you cry. 54 shots, though. Yeah. yeah it, 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 that, that game in Danville there, that third period to me, and, and this is not a knock, it, they, it looked like to me they played that game not to lose that game instead of playing to win. It's like they kind of sat back in that third period. I don't think they generated much offensive opportunity there in that third period. I think we only had six or seven shots. In that two, period. Bill. Was it two? two? Oh, I, 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 I saw this the other day. Six, you want to talk about six? The third period against Dayton and the two Danville games, six shots in the entire third period of all three games. Wow. wow. Something yeah. like that. No, oh, no, I'm sorry. That's not true. It's the four, 12. 12 shots. Yeah. Four, that, two, and six. And that, that's... So, how do you get six? How do you get two shots in a period? Huh. But, uh, you know, I think also a lot of credit has to be given to the Danville Dashers. I think right now, at this moment in the Federal Hockey League, from what I've seen, pound for pound, the Danville Dashers are the best team in the Federal Hockey League. I, Eleven in a row. You yeah, can't complain about that. Uh, no. um, which, of course, that streak was broken by Berkshire. We'll talk about that in just a second. But I think I think they're better than Watertown. I think they're better than Dayton. I certainly think they're my favorite to potentially go all the way, which is honestly, you know, as much as I would like to see Berkshire do it and Berkshire win the Cup, I think if, uh, if we don't make the playoffs or if we're eliminated earlier in the playoffs or even if we're eliminated to Danville, that I would kind of like to see them do well because I, I like their organization. They've got you know good group of guys there. They've been in the league for a while, and they've never really had success. They've always kind of been on the outside looking in, uh, and now they're kind of getting their chance to uh, get their, their due, uh, but they're potentially going to have to battle through a Berkshire Battalion team to get to that cup. And they're going to have to do it again because Harrison and Gordon just went off to uh, other leagues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Harrison I mentioned that. Yep, Harrison up to Fort Wayne, and Gordon's out to Huntsville. And that's about six players now that have been lost to uh, and that, and that doesn't include uh, Brian Denny, who was gone last week to the uh, to Southern League. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they've, and we talked about this a couple of podcasts ago, but they came back. And they were, certainly Harrison was back for, this, for these couple games. Yeah, yeah. and Denny's then still up. I think he's still in the, in the SP now as well. But, yeah, he's, he's gone again. Well, yeah. the following night, Sunday, the 15th of February, the battalion would turn it around and score five unanswered goals in yeah. the first ten minutes of the game. It was Morton, Guskov, Kazlowskis, Antipin, and Kazlowskis again. And the final score in that one would be eight to five. But here's another crazy shot total for you. Sixty-four total shots on net. And it was actually a split effort there. Messina playing 27 minutes, uh, stopping 22 of 26. And then uh, Bowden coming in, stopping 37 of 38 so basically, both goalies played a, in terms of the shot totals, played a complete game. Yeah, and Bowden got the win, which is good. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, half and half, and I wonder. And now for this game, uh, I think Mike McCurtain, who was hurt, uh, was actually doing the coaching. Mm-hmm. So not sure what he was thinking. I had a chance to talk to him today. I didn't actually remember to ask him this, but uh, I, you know, see each goalie playing half the game, and there was really probably would have been no reason to pull Messina out. I mean, unless, you know, after five goals after the second period, it was just maybe time to put Bowden back in there. Potentially. Um, But definitely, I think that that's actually been, despite, I mean, you hate to see a player go down with injury, especially a heart and soul guy like McCurtain. But from what I've seen and from what I've heard from the guys, it seems like he's been a real solidifying factor as uh, coming out, not necessarily as a captain, but as an older veteran and a leader on this team. And I think that could be a a big factor coming into playoffs. One thing I wanted to address, and I know that this is a big thorn in your side, uh, Ross, the three stars of the game from Danville. So it's an 8-5 to Uh. win for Berkshire. And Don't the get me started first on this, two man. stars of the game are <laughs> Garrett Sargis and Jonathan Giuliano. Now, Garrett, Garrett Sargis had two goals and two points, or just two goals for two points. Uh, Giuliano also had two points, a uh, goal and an assist. Uh, both men were minus on the evening. Or, excuse me, uh, Sargis was plus two. Uh, Giuliano was minus two. And the yeah. third star with four points was Mike Kazlowskis. Tom Tracy had five points in the game. 
Two goals, yep. three assists. He's not on there. Uh, Antipin had two points, a goal and an assist. He's not on that list. Guskov with a goal and an assist, two points. He's not on that list. And both of those players, I might add, were plus, were positive players on the score sheet. Sure. I mean, you got to figure, oh, you know, Kaz with four points and a plus three. Oh, can he, ple- in, a, in a winning effort, can he please be third star? Yeah. I mean, I, listen. And he wasn't here, even the top scorer. at the battalion games. Bill and I sit next to each other in the media box, and towards the end of the game, who do you like for three stars? And we have a quick discussion about it. And we've never had, a, you know, there's never really been a, any set of guidelines. It's just that in hockey, you know, the three stars are the three people who have done the most, you know, put on the best show, yeah. basically, who have, you know, contributed the most, made the biggest effort, made the biggest difference for that game. And if it's three people on the other team, then it's three people on the other team. But th- there is, it, it just, you know, everybody does it differently, and I don't want to get all judgy on everybody because there's, you know, as has been, there's a bit of a discussion on social media about this, and I've been, you know, talking to a couple of guys from a couple of the other teams, and, you know, maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't, but to me it kind of does, and I, I just like to see that, you know, these guys who are not really getting paid a whole lot of money and are really, you know, busting their asses all week, you know, sitting on buses for, you know, 60 hours, 64 freezing, hours on a bus. Freezing buses. In. Yeah, cold buses, you know, they have to go out to the community sometimes and, and, and go out there and, you know, and see when sometimes they don't feel like it, but they go out there and they put a smile on and they go out there and they help their community and they give back. <clears throat> for what, right? For stats, for getting noticed. Mm-hmm. And you're supposed to notice the people who deserve noticing. And listen, as much as Garrett Sargis and John Giuliano probably had a wonderful game, i got to admit I didn't see it, to have Tom Tracy come in here, who has been basically the second-half MVP of this team, in my opinion, yeah, between Tracy and Kaz, and for him not to get a star on this game, it, it just seems to me the travesty of the entire star-picking process. I mean, just looking at the last two games this weekend, Tracy had 11 points in two games. Guy's a nut. He's Guy going crazy. crazy. He's a, these tremendous, tremendous spurts he goes off on. Four points a game, five points a game. And not the first time he's done over four points a game either. Yeah, and the following Monday, it was an absolutely wild one in Steel City. A 10-6 to win for Berkshire, and it took the third period for Berkshire to win this one. They would score, let me look here, five goals in yeah. the third period to blow this one open. Uh, let me just get you the list of goal scorers because it's a lot. I'll have to take a deep breath here. Ah, uh, but it's easy because... Five players scored two goals apiece. Yeah. Uh, Gavrick, it, was, uh, it was Tracy, Morton, Gavrick, Antipin, and Kozlowskis. Yeah. Each of those guys scored two I mean, the whole game. And, and an incredible effort. Uh, Bowden with the win as uh, he made 35 saves on 41 shots. Um, a good homecoming for Tom Tracy. As I said, six points, two goals, and four assists. Uh, four points for Kozlowskis, who had two goals, two assists. Uh, three points for Antipin. It's great to see him getting on the scoreboard now. Yep. I know he's struggled of late. Uh, he had three points, uh, as did Gavrick. Uh, Morton with four points as well. And every player on the battalion was at least even or a plus. That's what I'll, that'll do it to you when you score 10. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I talked, to, um, I talked to one of the players and about, you know, why they got off to such a slow start. And, you know, it is, they had open tryouts. I mean, I, I don't know if people listen to the podcast. I think most of them who do understand what, what is going on in Steel City. Yeah. Um, basically, it is, it turned into from a pro league into a, an open, uh, an open tryout league. Yeah. And you can basically go in there, you pay Annis Reeves 50 bucks to go in there and try out. And if you make it, you're on the team and congratulations, here's a uniform and go, go play. So... The guys were, I think they were a little confused because, you know, you do have a tendency to play to the level of your competition, and before you know it, boom, there was five goals scored on them. And um, they, after a couple of periods, I think they just, you know, they shook their heads off, and, and I, I don't know what was said in the locker room. I'm sure something, because when they came out for that third period, it was basically what you expected to see for all three periods. Yeah. All right, yeah, so. But, yeah, still say they didn't get much going in the third period there. No, they didn't. Yeah, they've they've had they've had tough going throughout this whole season, um, and of course, as, as you mentioned, probably if uh, if fans aren't aware of what's going on in Steel City, then they're probably not going to get much good information from this podcast. <laughs> um, 
But regardless, let's look, uh, before we get into the upcoming weekend, let's look at the standings where they are right now. The Dayton Demons are tops in the league with a 31-12-4 record, a .660 winning percentage, but just one point off of them, the Watertown Wolves, as they've yeah, got 31... Statistical dead heat. Yeah, 31 wins, 12 losses, 2 overtime losses for a .659 winning percentage. Just behind them and streaking towards them, uh, the Danville Dashers, they've got a uh, .542 winning percentage as they're trending well upwards. We were talking a couple of weeks ago about the possibility of uh, Berkshire catching Danville, but that has totally changed now as Danbury is on an abs- is in an absolute tailspin right now as they're sitting currently at 24-18-4 with a .536 winning percentage right behind them the Berkshire Battalion with a 22 22 and 3 record 0.475 winning percentage as you said earlier uh Ross just two and a half games out from Danbury yeah they've they've been flirting around that mark pretty much the whole season and you know a couple of steps forward and a couple of steps back a lot of them you know there was that big nose dive during that terrible December road trip but you take that away and they've been doing very well as we talked last week they've they were uh Nine for their last 14. They split this last weekend series two and two. So, you know, they're still doing well. They're still above water. And if Dayton uh, and if Danbury continues on in this tailspin, and really there's no reason to assume that they wouldn't, yeah. um, you know, with eight games left, I, I think there is possibility for some of this motion to happen, especially as we were talking about before the podcast, given Danbury's upcoming schedule. Yeah, which is not an easy-looking schedule. No, it's not, and I'll, I'll give that to you right now. Uh, first off, this coming Friday, uh, Danbury will play Steel City at home to start off a homestand, uh, the Friday game against Steel City. But right after that, it's two games at home against the Watertown Wolves. Then Danbury will go on the road, play Dayton once and Danville twice. The following weekend, that's the uh, 27th and 28th of February. As uh, well, then, let me look here as... Danbury, uh, yes, Sunday, Danbury will wrap up that road trip Sunday, March the 1st in Danville. They'll come back home to play Watertown once again. They'll host Steel City for the last game of the season. But that's certainly tough. Two games against Steel City and four against the Watertown Wolves. And Watertown has had Danbury's number, especially in the later part of the season. Right, and I think we have have five more games, uh, if not six, against Watertown in the last eight. And uh, I think... You know, without having a specific number, I know that we've done pretty well against Watertown, at least the last five. Um, so, you know, there is, again, possibility for some upward motion. There's, it's, it's certainly not over yet, and the most exciting hockey is yet to come with the lines gelling. You've got those two forward lines going on. You've got the Soviet line of Gavrik and Antipin and Guskov. And you've got Tracy and Morton and Kazlowskis, and those guys are just tearing it up right now. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, if we can, you know, count on Messina to come back and do the job he's doing and the defensive core is all healthy and, and working it the way they know they can. Uh, I actually was talking to Guskov this morning. My daughter gave her a little Valentine sticker he put on a skate. She was happy as hell. He was happy as hell, too. That's this guy. Um, and he told me, and like we've been saying all along, these guys could just get in the playoffs. They, they, can, they can beat any team in this league, you know, in a playoff situation. I can yeah, see it. They, uh, they absolutely can. As uh, I'm looking here, actually, the uh, we're recording this on a Wednesday. So for some of you fans, if you're going to be listening tomorrow, actually the Watertown Wolves and Berkshire Battalion going at it Thursday night uh, up in Watertown to start this four-game weekend. And let me look at the schedule here. It starts off tomorrow, uh, well, Thursday, February 19th, up in Watertown. Then the Wolves will come back down for the ga- home game on Friday the 20th, followed up by a Saturday, Sunday home series against the Steel City Warriors. That will wrap up Steel City for the battalion. And from after the Steel City game on Sunday the 22nd, it's going to be all Watertown as Friday the 27th, Saturday the 28th, and then two more games which were uh, weather delays, which I'm not sure when they're going to be made up, but we'll have to wait and see. I still haven't gotten any word from the league about when those games. Currently on the schedule, they're listed for uh, the middle of March which doesn't exactly work out with the rest of the Federal Hockey League schedule, but we'll figure out what's going on with those games. Uh, yeah, but, I think they're probably going to look and see at those if it's going to make an impact on the playoff seating so those games actually get played, I would think. But 
uh, I think if it comes down to a seeding or somebody getting in or somebody in a playoff position that the game will have to be played. But I think they're kind of holding off to see if that's going to be a necessary game first. Yeah, it'll probably be on short notice, and uh, yeah. I, I guess they won't know. Well, because the one that was called off was in Watertown, so at least one of those games will have to be up in Watertown. Right. So we'll see. So, and any of the lost games from Steel City, because we haven't lost any games against Steel City, have we? We got to play that one, the 16th. That was the, supposed to be called off, but it wasn't. Yeah. Well, we had the two from earlier in the year. The, the first week of the season, we were supposed to play home, then go there for the oh, two. Oh, right. It never happened. So I don't know if those games will ever be be rescheduled or what the deal is with that. I, I can't. I don't have to see that happening, but yeah. you, know, you never know. Well, and, and also that's why the Federal Hockey League has gone to a winning percentage for its standings and not points, because obviously some teams playing a different amount of games. But I'm looking here at the game log. Uh, so far, the Battalion and the Wolves have played 11 games. Uh, the Wolves have won eight of them. But in the last, let me look here, the last four games, it's been dead even. As, uh, or rather, excuse me, in the last four games, uh, Watertown has a three to one advantage over Berkshire. The last Berkshire win against Watertown was that six to one pounding on the 31st. Uh, and I'm sure the uh, I'm sure the battalion fans are uh, remember that game pretty well. Yeah, um, hopefully, you know, uh, the the uh, game tomorrow night, they'll be able to keep their head on straight. There's been a lot of traveling for these guys. They were very tired today. Short they just turnaround. came back in. Yeah, they just came back in from Pennsylvania yesterday after that long road trip, and they're out again tomorrow morning for that long trip up to very cold Watertown. It was 20 below the other day in Watertown. I checked. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, exactly. Not that it was any warmer here. Well, I mean, that... It, Makes minus seven feel like uh, a walk in the park, but minus twenty, jeez. And um, you know, it is. Hopefully, they'll be able to get some rest on that bus and go in there and play a really good game because they have to play that game and then come back and play another one on Friday. And then hopefully, they'll be able to keep their uh, heads around them for the Steel City games and not fall into the trap that they fell into the first couple of periods last Monday. Yeah, I think that at, at this late point in the season with so few games left, p- the potential of losing even one of those two games at home at home against Steel City, if either of those come up as a loss for the Berkshire Battalion, that could mean potentially the end of the playoff push for Berkshire. I mean, really, it's, it's practically a win-out situation here for the Battalion. I mean, of course, the Danbury Whalers could lose out for the rest of their season. Yeah. And that would that would put Berkshire in the playoffs. They'd only have to really win a couple of games, but that's a very uh, that's a very tall order. Uh, Danbury is definitely not going to go down without a fight. They're a veteran team, and they know how to win when they have to. Well, I mean, they certainly have to. Yeah, everybody has I, to now. I think I think legitimately for Berkshire to have a have a realistic chance in the playoffs, right? We have to. I, I think it has to be no more than a, no no less than a six and two uh, effort here in these last eight. And it is a tall order against mostly Watertown. Yeah. Doable, but tough. Yeah, it's definitely. Doable. It's doable. Very doable. And the way that the way that this team has been playing Watertown and their attitude when they play Watertown has been incredible to watch. They don't see Watertown as one of the best teams in the league as this powerhouse offensive juggernaut. They see them as as a rival and, and really I think of all the teams in the league, the team that uh the battalion most wants to beat is Watertown. Now is is Tyler Howe coming back this weekend? He Maybe is enough. actually. I I talked to uh I talked to Darren this afternoon. Uh Dan Leach, who played with the team, he is going to be waived. Uh, he was waived today. Um, Unak is back, and we'll have Tyler Howe. I don't think we'll have Brandon Contrato. Uh, I'm not sure if we will or not. But Leach came with Contrato. Uh, mm-hmm. He was playing for Contrato's uh, Parry Sound uh, Juniors team, yep. of which Par- uh, Baron Brandon is the coach. Yeah. But, yes, I believe we'll have Tyler Howe for this uh, set of games. It, coming he, was up. A, he was a <laughs> fill-in player on the road. Yeah. yeah, I think they just brought him in yeah, dude, just to, to, fill, to fill a spot there. But I think the, the, the presence of Tyler Howe, we saw this against Dan Barry, the Friday night game when Tyler Howe was in the lineup. Julian Frazier had absolutely nothing to say on was, the ice. That was the quietest I've ever seen he, him. I've he known was him for years. constantly looking over his shoulder. And it, actually when he came into the box after he had kind of hit Gavrick from behind, down behind the battalion net there, he was all apologetic. Was, Did I really hit him that hard? I, guess, I didn't need to. I it was it was a different Julian Frazier than yeah. I've heard in the past. I have and, never, and I think that that's going to have a little bit of an impact coming to Watertown because now all of a sudden these bigger guys in Watertown, it's not Tristan Lisco they're going to be dealing with. It's going to be Brandon Howe or Tyler Howe, who is a pretty big guy. Yeah, exactly. And take a look at now a guy like Tyler Howe. You know, earlier on in the season, 
when you took a look at at the at the defense the, the at the at the uh, the six starting defensemen, you had guys like Rio, who was five nine, and Dadzi, who was about five nine, and who is still with the team, obviously. But uh, you know, even you know Morrison was only six feet tall. Uh, Kudo was a little over six foot six foot tall. But now you take a look at who's back there between Judds, who is uh, just a monster, and and Howe, who was an even bigger monster. Um, you know, and Sanders, who is not a small guy. Uh, you know, it's a big defensive core now. The battalion's defense has beefed up in size tremendously, and I think that's really, especially I know. And then you've got you know Gavrick standing in front now um, to make up for the uh, this size. I, I think it says a lot about you know the uh, the, the physical factor that this team can bring that might have been missing some of the earlier games in Watertown. Yeah, just yeah, one, 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 one more. Not forget that. Oh, go ahead, Al. Oh, one more note about that, that Julian Frazier experience. I've known him for years now, and I have never, ever seen him apologize, except for on that Friday night in Danbury. He, after he hit Gavrick, he skated over to the Berkshire bench, and he apologized. I have never seen him do that before. But when it comes to Tyler Howe, I've seen a, a lot of tough guys in the Federal Hockey League come and go. You know, this is my, my third year in the league. I've seen it all. And pound for pound, right now, Tyler Howe is the heavyweight champ. Is, and he hasn't even fought anybody yet, but he's the heavyweight champ in the Federal Hockey League because I've seen these other guys fight. Guys like Lobato, guys like Matt Ray, guys like Julian Frazier. They just they don't stand up to Tyler Howe. Tyler Howe is a serious, I mean, I hate to use this term, but he is a goon. He is a <laughs> well, serious let's, goon. Let's not discredit him, though, Al. I mean, this is, a, this is a kid also who was in training camp with the Arizona Coyotes and the Hartford Wolves. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm well, not, he's got some talent. He's, he's not an awful he's hockey player. Fighter. But he, the, the, I, I say the word goon because he's not just, you know, Matt Ray and uh, Frazier and Lobato and, and those kind of guys, they, they do a lot of talking. They play their hockey, you know, that kind of thing. Howe doesn't really have to talk. Howe just has to skate out there. And he sends right. a message immediately to these teams because these guys don't have these big-time fighters. I, I've seen some of these guys fight. It's not just necessarily their size or their toughness. I mean, because they're all tough guys. There's no doubt in that. They are all incredibly tough, tough men. But Tyler Howe, technically speaking, is the best fighter in the league. I mean, he, he fought in the LNAH. You don't get to do that for an extended period of time unless you are hard as nails. 77 minutes in 13 games in the LNAH. Yeah. Yeah. So one assist. <laughs> one assist, 77 PIMs in 13 games. Yeah, that's considered so a really you know good what he stat was there sheet. For. That's a good stat sheet for the LNAH. Yeah, yeah, that's what he was there for, the Cornwall River Kings. So, yeah, I mean, between, uh, again, I, I think now, is, and McCurtain, of course, he, he's, a, he's a six foot and change back there, too. Mm -hmm. You know, you take a look at, at the size that this team now has and the. Uh, the ability, I mean, you take a look, you know, guys like Guskov who will go, you know, Dolman will go, um, you know, Prendy will go, you know, a a any of these guys will, will take it. They're not going to take any crap from somebody. They're not going to be put off their game by a little bit of, uh, a little bit of yap yap that goes on from guys like, you know, Ray and Bronner and those dudes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think it's going to be really interesting. Uh, seeing Tyler Howe out there against the Watertown Wolves, because that's totally going to change the perspective. I mean, you know, Ray definitely is, is tough, and his size is very intimidating. And I think uh, when you have guys like Bronner as well, uh, Dion doesn't fight. Bronner will occasionally, but those big guys, they can really do some damage. But, you know, when you've got a guy like Tyler Howe, who's the biggest guy on the ice, you know, that's going to that's gonna quiet down a lot of those Watertown players. I mean, you've got guys like Corey Evelyn. Corey Evelyn hasn't learned yet. He keeps challenging Berkshire players. And they keep beating him. He's he's fought he's fought Guskov and he lost. He's fought Lisko about three times and has really never gotten the better of Lisko. I mean, he fought Dolman and Dolman just you know wrestled him to the ground. I, I don't think Dolman even really was taking him seriously. And it's just you know other guys like that, like Labelle. Labelle will come after guys, and and guys just have stopped taking this Watertown team seriously. Well, it is. Um... It is still a, there is still a very formidable uh, force to be reckoned with, oh, absolutely. and they have to win a lot of these games. So, and if they have to win by you know taking it to them physically, then that's probably how they'll do it. But uh, I think with Darren back and keeping them on an even keel with the, with these games at home, I, I think, and uh, being able to play you know at home, get some rest in there, 
And two games against Steel City, I think, is really going to be a terrific weekend for mm-hmm. hockey here yeah. at, at the foot. Absolutely. And, and also uh, a note that uh, having uh, Mike McCurtain on the bench, too, that steadying presence, we, we talked about that a little earlier. That's certainly going to help out. All right, let's 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 talk to Bill. I feel like, Ross, that, you know, we're so used to doing this uh, just with a twosome that we've just kind of drowned out Bill a little bit. Uh, no, that's okay. But what, what, are you, what, what are you most looking forward to for this upcoming weekend, Bill? Uh, I think you know this has to this this weekend we have to, it has to be a four and all weekend. Uh, I think they need to go up to Watertown and prove they can win in that building because let's face it, the last two games off there have been an absolute house of horrors um, where we've had leads and we've the third periods have killed us. Um, I think they need to go up there and, and make a presence right away Thursday night and say you know you're not going to beat us, and then come back here uh, same thing with Friday night. You know we get our hopefully we get a good. Uh, Good crowd in the foot, get a lot of fan support, and you know we just need to go out there and, and, and play hockey and stick it to them, and force Watertown into taking the penalties we know that they can take, and then make them pay on the power play. Yeah, and and one quick note to fans: make sure you keep voting for your Berkshire Battalion players and Coach Darren Lane for the uh, awards here. Also, you can go on the Federal Hockey League's website for the vote for the FHL's Man of the Year, and. I know, Ross, you convinced me on who I should be voting for, but convince the fans now on who they should be voting for from Berkshire for their Man of the Year. Yeah, we, we both had, we had a discussion about this while we were setting up for the call, and both Bill and I uh, had the same thought, and that I, my vote for FHL Man of the Year went to Jeff Sanders. Um, whenever you see a community event, Jeff is there. Whenever you see a picture of the kids in schools, Jeff is there. Whenever you see you know, uh, the team get together, uh, Jeff is there, and I think he's done assistant coaching, and he's been a great presence on the ice and in the locker room. And if you ask me, I think he's done a whole hell of a lot for this team and for this community, mm-hmm. and for that, he's got my vote for FHL Man of the Year. Yeah, totally agree. And if you haven't seen the video of uh, Jeff Sanders reading uh, the book with no pictures to uh, a group of school kids, I'm not sure what school he was at. That, uh, that video, that was up at, uh, at Florida Mountain, Mountain School, Florida yeah, Mountain, the yeah. Abbott School in Florida Mountain. That was hilarious. Yeah. I my daughter, he stitches. came to it, he, he read it uh, at the Sullivan School in North Adams, where my daughter goes, and they loved him there, too. Yeah. He's just a natural out in the community. Oh, but definitely, Jeff Sanders, man of the year in the FHL, just a consummate professional, uh, always, you know, never really loses his cool there, and he'll fight sometimes, too. Yep, absolutely. He's, he's, he's certainly no pushover. Plus, he's come back. He's, he's certainly been, I think, uh, one of the Berks- well, has been Berkshire's best defensemen. And he's not even a natural defenseman. He grew up playing forward. This is his well, first real test playing defense, and so far he has not done badly. No, I think he's doing pretty good. Like Lisko, though, there's a lot of converted defensemen. Will they oh, yeah. have Lisko playing defense up at the, uh, in the SP? No, they do not. Uh, he's playing, playing forward. forward. Um, and if you get a chance, go check out his fight uh, in the SPHL. He, he, he's still doing his thing. Uh, it's, it's still our same Captain Caveman, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's fun to watch him down there. All right, let's, let's wrap this up, guys. We, we, uh, before, we were talking about keeping it to 20 minutes. We're about 40 now, but we, you know, once we get started, we don't stop. We should learn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we ever will, but uh, oh, this, is, this has been a lot of fun. You know what? Honestly, I'm, uh, I'm, kinda, I'm getting a little sad now because I'm just realizing we're not going to have many of these podcasts left to do. Yeah, we only got three weeks left of the season, right? Yeah, so hopefully and, you know, that kind of playoffs. So you know the what? Playoffs the, be cool. The the boys gotta gotta make it to the playoffs because I want to keep doing these podcasts. Yeah, absolutely. So having a blast. Well, make sure to come out, uh, support the team, come down to the foot this weekend. It should be a crazy, crazy weekend. Two against Watertown, two against Steel City. We'll all be there. You can come pick our brains, talk to us, tell us how much you love the podcast. Because I mean, let's face it, this is pretty much gold here. It's hockey, hockey gold. Yep. Hockey gold. Um, but, yeah, absolutely, guys. It was great talking to you. Of course, Bill Bird joining us. And we'll have to have you on next week, Bill. Um, and yeah, of course, I'll be able to offer a different perspective uh, next week on the podcast. As, uh, Ross will have a different accompaniment in the penalty box with him on uh, Friday and Saturday. As I will actually be on the ice. Oh, oh, oh yeah, wow. really? I am. I'm lining up Friday night and refereeing Saturday. So this will be interesting. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> Who's doing scoring? We're going to have Shelly do it? Shelly will be in the box. Yeah. All right, good. So you know what? They're going to have to need somebody in that because if she's if she she's if if that penalty box is anything like it was, that Watertown box is going to be a lot of uh, a lot of fun for yeah. somebody. Yeah, it should, it should be interesting. <laughs> it makes me glad that I'm all the way across on the other side of the arena. Yeah, you are well out of harm's way there. Oh buddy. yeah. Although <laughs> although not totally, I, I was going through some of my old footage and uh, found a, a shot where Ian Riapel way way early in the season fired a shot well over the glass, nearly knocked the camera over. And uh, nearly took my head off in the process. 
Um, yeah, you know, I, I know we're keeping going on, but I see Rio's been waived by, mm-hmm. uh, Danbury. by uh, Danbury, and I think so is Cuda, right? I mean, I think both of those guys are right now out of the league. Hmm. Too bad. bad. Yeah, so, I saw Rio, Paul. I'm not sure about Cuda. I know I know Rio got waived, yeah. Yeah, it's too but, bad. Yeah, regardless, it's it's a business. You know, they're, they're not in it for the warm feelings. But yeah. everybody, make sure you come down to the foot this weekend. Of course, this has been the Berkshire Battalion Signal Corps podcast. Al Kessler with Ross Jacobs and Bill Bird. We'll be back with you next week, of course, covering the weekend that was and the weekend to come here in this push towards the playoffs for the Berkshire Battalion. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you on Friday night.